Welcome everybody to this session at Confectionery Live. Today I have the pleasure of speaking to Ellie Turner from 60 Decibels and we'll be talking about the Pharma Thriving Index. Ellie, could you please introduce uh, yourself and talk about your role at 60 Decibels? Sure. Hi everyone. My name is Ellie Turner. I'm the Deputy Agriculture Lead at 60 Decibels. 60 Decibels, if you're not familiar, is a social impact measurement company. We use what we call lean data methods to help companies understand and improve their social impact. Uh, before I joined 60 Decibels, I worked for almost 15 years in international agricultural development, implementing and evaluating programs that were aimed at improving smallholder farmer welfare, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. So you've, you've had lots of experience looking at, at farmer well-being and things <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah, for a long time. So in, in our first edition, we had a session from Tom Adams, the co-founder, uh, the co-founder, sorry, the co-founder of 60 Decibels, and he used this phrase surviving or thriving, which really struck me. Could you sort of explain what this phrase means and, and what its what its significance is? Sure. So in the past, there have always been kind of different definitions of well-being. So any company or any NGO that was working with farmers could decide for themselves what constituted success. And what we really want to move toward is a standard definition of well-being that is holistic. So if a farmer, to say that a farmer is thriving, you can't just say that they're using a better growing practice, right? They need to also be earning a profit. They need to have some agency over their market relationships, and they need to be able to feed their families. Um, and a farmer who's just barely surviving might not have savings. They might not have, be, they might be stressed about meeting their family's basic needs. So what we did was we developed this spectrum for understanding farmer well-being on, on all these dimensions. And it's a really simple scale of zero to 100. Score of zero at the very bottom suggests that a farmer is in crisis. They're earning really far from a living income. They're unable to save and they have to rely on daily food, co food security coping strategies. Um, and they're just farming kind of out of a necessity to survive. Whereas a farmer who's thriving or, or getting a score of 100, which is really excelling, um, means that a farmer is financially resilient and farming is an essential sort of profitable livelihood for them that more than meets the basic needs of their family. Absolutely. And I, I hear you mentioning standardizing data, um, which I think is really interesting because I think there's been a lot of conversation, particularly when we look at cocoa farmers and cocoa farming as a whole, about how data can provide these key insights we're looking for, because I think it could be helpful, as you say, to have that scale and have that measurement. Um, so with regards to your farmer thriving index, um, I'd be really interested in hearing about how you identified key categories to measure um, farmer well-being against. Sure. So we the index focuses on four dimensions that are critical to a farmer's well-being, and these are food security, financial resilience, livelihood sustainability, and living income. Living income is there's a set benchmark for living income in Ghana and and in most um, origin countries, and this is defined as the total level of household income that's required to achieve a decent standard of living. Um, so in order to develop these these four dimensions and the indicators that support them. We had a group of experts that was focused on it. We did some external research to ensure that we were aligned with other in industry standards. Um, but it's really been a phased approach. And so we started with a pilot last year where we collected a lot of indicators. Um, and when we released that, we got a lot of feedback from industry stakeholders and we were able to refine the methodology further. Um, we really wanted to get a holistic view of farmer well-being, right? Um, but we wanted to do it in a lean way. And to us, lean means that we collect data fairly quickly. We really want to respect the time of the farmers that we're talking to. And so we don't ever ask for more than like 15 or 20 minutes on the phone with them. Um, and lean also means that the data is easily understood by decision makers. So we didn't want to have like this three hour interview with a farmer that came up with this really complicated data set that was a 50 page report that no one could understand. Right. We wanted it to be simple and clear for everyone to understand and also relevant for farmers everywhere. So we're talking about cocoa, but we want to be able to use this index for farmers in any supply chain. Um, so in short, we kept it really simple, but what this means for an index is that we pared it down. So when we first started, we started with more indicators and we did some analysis on things that were really highly correlated with each other and would be duplicative, and therefore we were able to pare it down um, even further. It's, it's interesting to hear that your focus from the start is on creating data that's easily understandable and easily accessible. Um, was that something that was on your mind straight away or 
did you have a conversation with someone where you realised that you, you need to make sure that, as you say, there are four key areas and, and they know what those areas are about and, and how they can measure farmer impact? We didn't necessarily start with the four key areas, but it is a key principle of 60 decibels and of our business model that data needs to be easily understood, right? In order for it to change how someone makes a decision, it has to be really easily understood. It, it can't it can't require a degree in statistics. It can't require a ton of like agricultural knowledge. It needs to be something that someone can digest pretty quickly, understand really quickly. And so that was always in the back of our mind when we developed an index was, is this going to make sense to someone who doesn't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it? And are these indicators clear? Is it clear when we say like a farmer is earning a profit or they're not earning a profit? That's clear to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, what was your process for gathering data for the index? You briefly mentioned that you wanted to make sure your conversations with farmers were quite short. So could you just talk us through how, how it went? And it sounds like it was quite a mammoth challenge to face, to be able to talk to as many farmers as you can, keep that compressed and then have to analyse all that data and understand what it means. Well, that's what we do at 60 decibels. It's actually, you know, we, we do it every day, right? So we have built a structure that makes it really, really easy for us to talk on the phone to farmers, get their data quickly, analyze it quickly. But um, for this particular study, it was a little different than, than what we normally do. Um, we wanted to survey farmers that would be representative of the general cocoa farming population in Ghana. And so we needed to recruit those farmers into our sample from the start, right? We couldn't just rely on a company to provide us with their phone numbers. And so we did some in-person recruitment um, that was geographically distributed. And then from all of the farmers that we had enrolled and we'd gotten their consent to participate, we drew a random sample of 750 that we had those phone conversations with. And, you know, over the course of maybe about a month. Um, yeah, and then and then analyzing the data is, is fairly straightforward. We're, we're pretty good at that. Um, the, in, in Ghana, actually the most, the, the biggest challenge that we faced in doing this was the inflation rate. Um, so it's, it's already really, really hard to measure living income from a farmer. They don't necessarily keep records. They don't necessarily have sort of perfect recall of what they've spent or earned or over the course of the year. Um, but what we faced in Ghana was an inflation rate of over 50% this year. And so we have a living income benchmark that is set annually but we have prices of things changing over time. The government set price of cocoa changed over the course of the study that we were doing. Um, and so understanding, okay, in this month, when we're talking to this farmer, what constitutes a living income was a sort of particular challenge for us with the methodology. It's Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And it's it sounds like a challenge, but I suppose for you, in making sure that the data was accurate, you had to adapt it. Um, could you tell us about about your key findings um, from from the index? Yeah, so um, I've alluded to this a little bit already, but one of the things that stood out to me was that more than half, I think around half of the farmers that we spoke to um, said that they did not earn more than they spent on cocoa farming, um, which is crazy. Like, can you imagine doing a job and not getting paid for it? Um, this happens in agriculture a lot, right? Because a farmer will make investments in their farm, like they will pay for labor, they'll buy fertilizers, and then there's a great deal of uncertainty what the payback is going to be, right? Um, it could just depend on how much rain you get. It could depend on how the market price fluctuates. Uh, it could depend on, you know, if there's a pest outbreak on your farm. Um, and in cocoa, in particular, there's, there's sort of this sunk cost element where they already have the trees, right? It's not like in maize where you have to plant, make the decision to plant year over year. You have the trees on your land, you're sort of like, well, I might as well harvest them, even if it's uh, not a profitable endeavor. So I think this kind of calls into question the long term sustainability, right? They're still making the decision to harvest their cocoa this year and maybe next year. But if it's not profitable, kind of what are they going to do in the long term? Um, the the promise. Oh, sorry. Do you have a follow up? <laughs> no, no, no. Go, go ahead. I was going to give you one more finding. So the promising thing that we found on, on the good side was that the farmers actually report really healthy relationships with their buyer. So this is good news because these are the indicators that the industry actually has the most direct control over. So farmers are getting paid fairly. And in Ghana, actually, the this means they're getting the government set price. Um, in some contexts, a government will fix a price for a given product, but the farmers won't actually receive it, right? The traders won't adhere to it. 
Um, but what we heard from almost every farmer in Ghana was that they're getting that fair price um, and they're getting paid on time. So they're not waiting for their buyers to deliver payments like weeks or months later. They're getting paid usually at the point of sale. Um, they said that they trust their buyers. There's no sense really that they're being exploited by their buyers. Um, and they're also able to sell everything that they harvest. So they're not getting stuck without a buyer or risking sort of wasting their harvest after they've harvested it. They've all been able to sort of offload all of their produce, which is another really sort of strong sign about the market. And I mean, I can't imagine what it what it's like to earn less than you than you pay. I mean, how, you talk about su- sustainability um, and whether this is a st- sustainable situation, um, which which is food food for thought, right? Um, yeah, a lot a lot a lot of challenges to address. So I'd, I'd be really interested to hear as well um, when you when you release this data and and what your key findings were, how people responded to um, the index. And whether they, they they found it helpful to have to have this benchmark. Yeah, so companies are finding the tool valuable. Um, we keep hearing that the dimensions of well-being that are in the index are really the exact dimensions that they want to look at and that they want to understand. Um, for the Ghana data, our results to date have been from pilots. So we had a pilot that we released last fall, um, and the work this year is still sort of in progress. Um, So we haven't been able to draw any really broad conclusions about the population, but we do have two large chocolate companies that are using the index now um, to understand their supply chains and actually in other origins. Um, And we're also scaling up the tool um, in coffee as well. So we're really excited. We have a couple of of things to watch for later this year um, to see how the tool works out. I mean, that, that that sounds really exciting. So I will, I will keep an eye on that. Um, I, did have a follow-up question, which I've just remembered to ask now. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about, so you mentioned financial security, but there's also a lot of talk about um, the um, cert, like financial services, whether farmers have access to that. So did you find that they're easily able to manage their finances and, and keep track, or is that a challenge for them? We found that only around half of them are able to save. And savings is really critical in agriculture because it enables you to sort of smooth your consumption um, instead of, you know, having to spend everything right when you make your harvest and then having seasons where you where you have no income. Um, so savings is definitely a key area for, for improvement. And it's also sort of a key determinant of resilience, right? If you don't have any savings to rely on in the case of an emergency, um, be that a, a climate shock, be it a health shock, be it any sort of other sort of shock, what happens is you have to rely on other coping strategies that actually can set you on sort of like a lower trajectory, right? They might have a, a much longer term impact on you, the, the coping strategy that you have to use if you don't have those savings. So I think that is really the number one sort of financial element that we would need to work on with farmers or, or give them access to savings products or, or help them to in- encourage them to save. But of course, they need to be earning a profit to be able to save. So, <laughs> with 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 your background in agriculture, I imagine you understand quite well that that is a particular area where there have been lots of challenges with regards to climate change, with regards to the fluctuating prices. When when we talk about it, as you say, it sounds like. If you're a farmer and you don't have savings and something like that happens, how 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 do you cope? Um, it's it's interesting. I I used to work for an agricultural publication, so that that was a big thing. Just support to farmers in general. Um, in in your view, would you say the challenges to cocoa farmers are evolving, or would you say that they are facing the same challenges they have 20 years ago? Um. Some of the challenges are are the same, but I think that the challenge of climate change is emerging and is sort of exacerbating all those other challenges that previously existed, right? So like just productivity and using the right practices um, has always been sort of a challenge, but now with, with, with climate change, they have to do things differently. So they can't just rely on the, the traditions that they've always used to grow cocoa. They might need to look into using different varieties of trees. They might need to look into 
looking for different pests or using different pest management practices, they may need to know, they may, may need more weather data on like a regular basis. Um, so I definitely think that that's changing and there's just so much more irregularity in the weather patterns that they have to grapple with that it's just, you know, agriculture has always been a really risky livelihood and it's just getting sort of riskier and riskier. And so thinking about ways that they can sort of insure themselves against those risks is the number one priority, I think, right now. Could, could you talk about what you would say the main impacts of climate change have been on farming? I think it, it, it depends on the, you know, the location and the, and the supply chain, but the, I mean, the, so in some, in some places, right, the temperature is rising in some places, the rain comes later. And in some places, the change in patterns results in a, a pest outbreak. But what it means is that you need to use different technologies than you've used before. You need to use different practices than you've used before. And if you're a farmer and you're not like tapped into an information or an advisory service, that's going to tell you, Hey, things are changing. Don't do it this way anymore. Do it this way. Um, then you're really exposed. Um, so it's it's a general challenge and the, the specifics of it, I think, are different everywhere, but it, it is really the same challenge that they're all facing. Do you think there's enough awareness around um, the particular impact of climate change? I mean, climate resilience is a term that's that's being spoken about a lot more, but when you look at companies who are sourcing cocoa from these farmers for instance do you think that they're aware I think that they're aware but I don't know that it's necessarily trickling down into action right I think that they're at, at the highest levels there is all of this talk about climate change everyone is talking about climate change and everyone knows that it's going to impact agricultural productivity but where there is not enough awareness is sort of like how you get that, how you get that from the top all the way down into a channel that's going to change a farmer's welfare and what they specifically need. Um, and so I think you sort of have a lot of organizations that are promoting climate smart practices, but they're different everywhere. They have to be different everywhere. Um, and sometimes things just kind of get lost, um, you know, in the, in that pathway down to the farmer. Yeah, there's there's this um, way of seeing it as in the the farmers still don't have any power or any any say, um, particularly yeah. when you look at what they're paid for for their cocoa. So, um, yeah, I can see that being an being an element. Um, what what is the value of speaking to these farmers directly? And do you think enough companies are doing this? No, I don't think enough companies are listening to farmers directly. I think what a lot of companies do is they'll have a sustainability program in their supply chain, in some part of their supply chain, and then they'll be able to say, okay, this program did this, it reached this many farmers, it promote, maybe it promoted climate smart practices, but you still don't know what the farmers think about it and how their welfare has changed. And you can only know that if you start talking to the farmers, you talk to a representative sample of them, and you ask them questions about all of these different dimensions of well-being, um, that's when you really know sort of how they're doing. And then, of course, to take it to the next level, you you would want to be able to compare how they're doing to to other farmers in similar situations for that to be meaningful. I, I, that's that's interesting that you raise that because um, I can I can imagine from from the point of view of people who don't like if you're looking at a consumer, for instance, they don't really know too much about what's going on with farmers. They know that um, cocoa farmers aren't paid enough and they know that they want to try to buy from brands who are supporting them. But I suppose if the the only information they're getting from the, from the companies they buy the chocolate from and that information is, yeah, we, we are looking after farmers, then they might not question that any further. So um, it sounds like the, the main point you're making is about giving farmers a voice and just learning directly from them what's working and what's not. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, consumers are conscious now and they're be they're becoming savvier, savvier. So they used to, you know, I'm thinking of like so long ago when, you know, my mom, who's like a really, she fancies herself like a very conscious consumer and she loves chocolate. And every time I'd come home, she would just be like, oh, this, you know, this chocolate company is an enemy now because she heard like a random news article about them. And she's like, I can only buy this one, but it would change like every year because it would be totally like anecdotal and based on headlines. And I think we shifted from that to now there's like all these different 
certifications. I work in agriculture and I love chocolate and I still don't know what all the different like, like emblems on the chocolate packages are. Um, but we've shifted to that, right? It's, it's, it's become more advanced. And I think really the next step is having it be standardized and having consumers know, okay, the farmers are doing well. We can feel confident that this brand is, t- is listening to their farmers and they are treating them well and they're doing okay. Um, just as sort of a minimum, a minimum standard. But that's a really good point. I mean, when we talk about certifications and emblems, when I was listening to you, I was thinking, yes, I don't understand all the emblems. I don't. Now, now that I work in the confectionery sector, I, I can recognise more of them. But if you're someone who doesn't and doesn't have that knowledge, um, do you do you think do you think certifications help? Um, do you think um, consumers understand them well enough to know what they mean? I think they help. I don't think consumers understand them well enough to know what they mean. I think a consumer is generally just like, oh, there's a certification, so this must be good. And maybe it's better, you know, it's at least better than one without a certification. That's good. Um, And I think a lot of them, you know, were environmental originally. And so had to do with, okay, we're not, you know, we're not destroying the forest by eating this chocolate. So that's a good, that's a good thing. Um, But I don't think they necessarily know what all of the different certifications mean. And so there's a little bit of education. And again, just coming back to like, we have to make data simple for people to understand. Um, it, It can't, it can't be like this really long, complex analysis that goes into this certification or the consumers aren't going to understand it. It just has to be farmers are thriving. Yeah, of course. And and when you release your data, how how are you communicating it? Um, and also, are you, are you, I suppose, utilizing social media? Are you using that as a form of educating and, and raising awareness? Is, has that become a main means of communicating, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, for us, we haven't, we're we are not the industry, right? So we like to be kind of the data behind the industry that is a third party. And so we certainly, you know, are advocating for standardized impact data, benchmarking across companies and across value chains. But I think what we would like to see is really, you know, the industry sort of take the lead on like, this is what we were doing and this is why it is important. And so I think a partnership there would be, would be really critical. Absolutely. Sort of like, um, they they take the reins and the responsibility to pass that message on. Um, I remember when um, we interviewed Tom, um, I asked him a question about, you know, do you think farmers are collaborating enough with the industry? And he responded by going, well, I don't think the responsibility and the owner should be on the farmers to collaborate with the industry. <laughs> I think it should be the other way around. Um, so that really struck me. And I thought, wow, you know what? Maybe my perception and my view is that I'm putting too much responsibility on farmers and not enough pressure on the industry to do that. So I just thought that was food for thought. Um, and that's mm-hmm. what what you said reminded me of that. Um, so it's 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 all very thought provoking. Um, so thank you, Ellie, for talking with me today and for taking the time to speak about a very important topic. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do reach out to her. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure.